Pope Francis has spoken with his own mouth and written it down as a record for the history of the world. In his encyclical, Laudato Si, confessing exactly who they truly worship, allowing the fruits of the Vatican to be revealed. And I believe that these words that came directly from the mouth of the beast. Ladies and gentlemen, these are things that you should not take for granted. These are the final warnings in which the world is being given the last chance to make things right with the Lord. My friends, you who are watching this video, if you came to this channel thinking that I'm going to give you a soft, watered down message, trust me, you're in for a rude awakening. I'm also going to share with you a video directly from Pope Francis. And in this video, the mouth of the horse speaks some very interesting things. Hopefully, when you hear this, you will make changes around your life and you will say, today, I'm officially changing the things which I thought I was doing that I thought was right and I'm making things right with the Lord now. It's time to get ready because probation is closing. First thing is first, let's go to Laudato Si, the Pope's encyclical which was written in 2015. It is very interesting to note that the word Laudato Si means praise be to you. That is a reference to worship. The entire book is based upon praise be to you. Now the question is, who is it? that the Pope is referring to when he writes Laudato Si. In fact, they have a website designated strictly for Laudato Si. So, follow along with me. We go to chapter 2 of Laudato Si. Chapter 2 headline reads the following, The Gospel of Creation. Within this chapter, we go to section number 4, which states the message of each creature in the harmony of creation within that section we go to page number 87 and here are the words follow along because this is very important when we see God reflected in all that exists our hearts are moved to praise the Lord for all his creatures and to worship him in union with them this sentiment finds magnificent expression in the hymn of Saint Francis of Assisi. All right, it sounds good, but let's continue reading. Praised be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day and through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor and bears a likeness of you, Most High. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any idea what we just read? Do you have any idea what Pope Francis just said to you? Let's just keep reading and we're going to come back and dice all of this up and break it down so that all of us can be on the same page and understand exactly what Pope Francis is saying. We continue reading the following and I quote, Praised be you, my Lord, through Sister Moon and the stars. In heaven, you formed them, clear and precious and beautiful. Praised be you, my Lord, through brother wind, and through the air, cloudy and serene, and every kind of weather through whom you give sustenance to your creatures. Praised be you, my Lord, through sister water, who is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. Praised be you, my Lord, through brother fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. What we have just read, ladies and gentlemen, I never said that out of my mouth. These are the words that came directly from the encyclical written by Pope Francis himself. This breakdown which we are going to do about these very statements, I'm going to make it so simple so that even a young child will be able to understand exactly what I'm speaking. First thing is first, I'm going to bring the Ten Commandments and the words of the papacy is going to be held against the Ten Commandments. And we are going to see whether the Pope passes the test or whether he fails the test. In his statement, he brings the following creations in nature. Number one, the sun, 
Number two, the moon. Number three, the stars. Number four, the wind and air and clouds, which is the weather. Number five, water. And finally, number six, fire. Now let's observe how Pope Francis spoke of these creations, the creations of Yahweh through Jesus Christ. Observe the following. Praised be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son. Pause. That means, praise be you, O Lord, we are worshipping you, O Lord, with all your creatures. He just told you, we are worshipping God along with all of his creatures, especially Sir Brother Son. He goes on to say, he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor and bears a likeness of you most high in other words he likens the son to god himself furthermore he goes on then to say praised be you my lord through sister moon and the stars in other words praised be you my lord we are praising you O lord through sister moon and the stars here's another way of saying exactly what pope francis just said we are worshiping you O Lord, praise be unto thee, Almighty God, through the moon and the stars and the wind, the air and the water and the fire. We are praising God through these creations. That means we are not worshipping Him directly, but we are worshipping His creation. And by worshipping His creation, we are worshipping Him. But He likens the Son as being equal to to the likeness of God. The question is, which God? If the Son is equal to God, then that means that the Son is worthy of worship higher than all the other created things of nature. Do you have any idea what we have just read right now, ladies and gentlemen? What we have just read is pantheism. This is called pantheism. Pantheism is the worship of nature. In fact, let's go to Google. Listen to the definition of pantheism. Pantheism is defined as follows, and I quote, Pantheism is the view that the world is either identical to God or an expression of God's nature. It comes from pan, meaning all, and theism, which means belief in God. Pause. What comes to mind when you think of pan? If pantheism comes from pan, do you have any idea where pan originates from? You see, pan, ladies and gentlemen, is actually a being that looks exactly like Baphomet. However, he is a male version that does not have titties or titties like breasts of a woman. Rather, Pan is half man or half human and half goat. Here's an image of Pan. Now the question is, who exactly is Pan? Well, in ancient Greek, and I'm reading from Google, in ancient Greek religion and mythology, Pan is the god of the wild, lowercase g. God of the wild, shepherds and flocks and mumbo jumbo. You get the idea. The bottom line is that Pan is associated with nature. Those that worship Pan are pantheists. Pantheism is simply the worship of nature. And it's very interesting that Pan just happened to give resemblance to Baphomet. Baphomet is associated with devil worship. And there are many people who tend to be confused into thinking that Lucifer and Satan are two different things. In fact, others will go to the point of saying that a devil and a demon are two separate entities. Not knowing that a devil and a demon are one and the same. There's no different. They are one and the same entity. Satan is no longer referred to as Lucifer here on earth because he used to be called Lucifer when he was in heaven. Lucifer means light bearer. He was the bearer of God's light upon the heavenly angels. He was highly elevated above all the angels and because of his beauty, which is documented in the book of Ezekiel, he began to look at himself and because of his beauty, he began to think evil thoughts and those evil thoughts were revealed in the book of Isaiah. And in the book of Isaiah, that's when Lucifer envied the very throne of God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the Most High. He envied the very throne of God and he wanted to be like the Most High. As a result, 
he initiated a war. That war is documented in the book of Revelation. And that war caused one third of heaven's angels to be cast out with Satan, who now is referred to as the dragon, the serpent of old, who is also called the devil and Satan. He was the serpent of old because he was the one who deceived Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden. Ladies and gentlemen, the worship of nature is the worship of Lucifer. The worship of Lucifer is the worship of Satan. You can't escape that and say, no, I'm only just worshiping nature. Now, when we examine Pope Francis' statement with regards to paying homage to St. Francis of Assisi, these words, ladies and gentlemen, you can't take them lightly because St. Francis of Assisi was a nature worshiper. He was a pantheist, just like all the other popes who have ever come and sat on the throne of the papacy. The Vatican thrives on paganism. It's very interesting that he makes the appearance of the sun as the appearance of the Most High, yet at the same time he then goes on to say, Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Moon and the stars. It means, praise be you, my Lord, in the name of the moon, in the name of the stars. In other words, we are coming to you, O Most High. We're coming to worship God through the worship of all these other celestial bodies of the heavens. Ladies and gentlemen, that is pantheism. That is paganism. Do you think it is a coincidence that everywhere you look on the Vatican, you see the symbols of the sun and you see the symbols of the moon? Is it a coincidence that you also just happen to see symbols of a dragon inside the Vatican? Is it just by pure coincidence that you see the worship of dead saints? Do you not realize that the Vatican is the main center of idolatry? Is it just by pure coincidence that when you look at the Vatican, you see statues and images of angels and demons at war with one another? Do you not see that there is a promotion of idolatry at the Vatican. People kiss the feet of statues of dead saints. Do you not see how people kiss the finger of a statue of a Pope? Do you not see how people kneel down to the statue of Virgin Mary? Do you not see how people go and even look at the image of Christ and they bow down to the statue? When you observe these things, ladies and gentlemen, now the question is, the final test, let us put this against the law of God, which is the judge. Standing against the Ten Commandments, does the Vatican pass this test of being righteous and of being of one accord with Scripture? Because, ladies and gentlemen, the Second Commandment states the following. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Does the papacy pass this exam? The answer is clear without a shadow of any doubt. No. Idolatry runs far too deep in the veins of the papacy. If you really observe carefully, ladies and gentlemen, it is not by pure coincidence that the majority of the Christian world also has been conditioned into idolatry and into paganism without them even knowing it. Observe this quick simple logic. If the papacy is admitting to you that the Son is considered equal to God, that means that they are going to do everything in their power to glorify the Son and to bring homage and glory to Son worship. Does that not make sense? It all fits with the agenda of the papacy for them to also alter the fourth commandment of the Lord, which states, Remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. The Lord sanctified his own day, while the devil 
through the papacy sanctified his own day. The Lord sanctified the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath, which we call Saturday, whereas Satan glorified the first day of the week, which is the day of the sun. His leadership is to pay tribute and homage to sun worship. Does it not make sense in your head? Think about this. Does it not make sense that if the papacy favors the sun and likens the sun to the Most High, doesn't it make sense that they will do their part to make some changes with regards to times and laws? You see, at creation, the Lord gave each day a number. Day one, day two, day three, four, five, six. But the seventh day is the only day that the Lord gave a name. The seventh day is called the Sabbath. And lo, comes the pagans and the papacy. What did they say? Nay, the first day of the week, we are going to call the day of the sun. We are going to refer the first day as sun day. And after the sun comes the moon, and after the moon comes the other stars. Oh, does it not make sense? It fits with the statements. First the Pope worships the Son and likens the Son to the Most High. After the Son, then he pays homage and tribute to the moon and the stars. Listen to this video in which the Pope speaks of the true Sabbath. Observe. Se vive con el acelerador puesto desde la mañana hasta la noche. Y eso arruina la salud mental, la salud espiritual y la salud física. Más aún, arruina y destruye la familia y por lo tanto la sociedad. El séptimo día descansó. Lo que los judíos tenían y tienen, ¿no es cierto?, los observantes, como sagrado cumplir el Shabbat. El sábado se descansa un día a la semana, al menos eso. Para la gratuidad, para dar culto a Dios, para estar con la familia, para jugar. Clearly, he mentions that the seventh day is Saturday, the day in which people are to keep holy and sacred and rest upon it. Now, let's look at the true Catholic confession in which they admit that the Protestant movement has been in thorough accord with the Roman Catholic Church because of Sunday sacredness. Sunday sacredness unites all churches to the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, it doesn't really matter if you call yourself a Protestant. Because if you call yourself a Protestant, yet you still go and observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath, you are paying homage to the Son, you're ultimately paying homage to the papacy. Because that is their mark of authority. These are not my own words. These are their own words. Observe. Taken from the Catholic mirror and can be found in a book called Rome's Challenge in which a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church writes these confessions. He wrote the following and I quote. Numerically considered, the Seventh-day Adventists form an insignificant portion of the Protestant population of the earth. But as the question is not one of numbers, but of truth, fact, and right. A strict sense of justice forbids the condemnation of this little sect without a calm and unbiased investigation. This is none of our funeral. The Protestant world has been, from its infancy in the 16th century, in thorough accord with the Catholic Church in keeping quote-unquote, holy, not Saturday, but Sunday. This simply means, ladies and gentlemen, that anyone who continues to carry the tradition of observing Sunday as the Christian Sabbath or the Christian day of rest, they are in thorough accord with the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Catholics themselves, they said with their own mouths, who is the true Protestant? Observe. The Adventists are the only body of Christians with the Bible as their teacher, who can find no warrant in its pages for the change of the day from the 7th to the 1st, hence the appellation Seventh-day Adventist. Their cardinal principle consists in setting apart Saturday 
for the exclusive worship of God in conformity with the positive command of God himself repeatedly reiterated in the sacred books of the Old and New Testaments, literally obeyed by the children of Israel for thousands of years to this day, and endorsed by the teaching and practice of the Son of God whilst on earth. <clears throat> my, my voice. Whatever. You get the idea, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone who continues to carry on the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church by observing Sunday sacredness, they are paying homage to the papacy. By paying homage to the papacy, you are actually becoming a pantheist, which actually is the worship of nature. In simple terms, Sunday worship is nature worship. Why? Because it is the day of the sun. And you become a pantheist just like the Pope. Pope Francis is promoting pantheism. And that is what you become when you align yourself with the Roman Catholic Church. From its infancy, the Roman Catholic Church was always involved in paganism. Ladies and gentlemen, what am I trying to tell you? At the end of the day, this is a wake-up call for you. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. Because the judgment of God is going to fall upon this church. God's plagues are going to fall upon anyone who accepts her mark. Her ecclesiastical mark of authority, which is Sunday sacredness. What I have simply just shared with you is just a small segment out of many. There's so much that can be spoken that will take series and series and series. Ladies and gentlemen, obeying the Ten Commandments of God is a salvational issue. If you are not told this, you're going to be an outlaw. The Bible says that if you break one commandment, you are guilty of breaking them all. In the New Testament, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Many people say, well, the commandments are only two. Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love thy neighbor. Well, the question that I have is, if you love the Lord your God, will you have any idols before him? No. If you love your God, will you take his name in vain? No. If you love the Lord your God, will you have any other gods before him? No. If you love the Lord your God, will you break the Sabbath? Many of you will start to say, well, that's legalism. No, it's not, ladies and gentlemen. That's a part of the Ten Commandments. If you love your neighbor, will you kill them? No. Will you steal? No. Will you commit adultery? No. Will you covet them? No. What did I just summarize? That's the Ten Commandments. There are two tablets of stones. The first is love to God, and the second is love to your fellow brethren. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I will just leave it at that because the video is now lengthy. I'm going to cut it here at this point. I will let the Holy Spirit do the conviction. At this point, all I have done is shared with you the information. You have to make the decision based upon the information that you have received. How you choose to respond is entirely in your hands. So, you choose this day who you will worship. Whether you will worship the Lord your God or whether you will worship men and tradition. That's in your hands to decide. Thank you for joining me. This is the Controversy 7. You take good care of yourselves. Be safe and I will see you guys next time.